Hello and welcome to the latest webinar from the Guild of One Name Studies. Um, I can see lots of you have got your cameras on. I'm going to ask you to turn your cameras off, please, just because it will the, re the recording is going to be available to the public for a while after this event and people might not want their faces being seen by lots of random people. Um, so it just means you've got the opportunity to still hear it and participate but just have your cameras off. Um, so we're going to, I'm hoping everyone can um, is familiar with the, the drill in terms of what we are, what you need to do if you can't hear or you have a problem. So on the right hand side, you should have got what I would call a little dashboard. If you have any problems in terms of you can't hear or there's an issue, please just double check that you've got your, um, your volume is up. Um, I know that sounds obvious, but sometimes people don't realise that it's too low. Um, and also just to make sure that if you have problems still, just put a little note in the question and answer box and I will pick it up. So I'm sure our speakers today need no introduction. So I'm going to hand you over to Janet Few and to Chris Braun and they're going to talk to us about their study that's been going for 40 years. So that is such a phenomenal um, achievement. So over to you guys. Right, thank you very much. Are you receiving me loud and clear? Yes, we are. Oh, that, that's a relief. Um, we had a slight hiccup with the technology just now, so let's hope this is going to work. So yes, welcome everybody. Lovely, before you turned your cameras off, to see some familiar faces, both from the Guild and the world of the Brawns. And we are here to talk about our study, but hopefully to give you some ideas if you are somebody who's conducting a study yourself as to things that you might want to do or might want to not do. So 40 years and we are still a one name society. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we have done and also about what we do do. And those of you who are members of the Guild of One Name Studies will probably be familiar with the recommended seven pillars or the seven research steps uh, for a one name study. So I will kind of talk in, in those terms and really share some ideas, some of which you might want to pinch and please do. And some of them you might think, no, I don't want to do that. And maybe learn from some of our mistakes as well. And we we'll talk about where we think we might be going. I would say the next 40 years, but I'm not sure I'll quite make that. But maybe somebody else will on our behalf. Obviously, as a one name study, we're aiming to collect all references to the surname and to its variants across the world. But this is a collective one name study and it's always been a collective one name study for the whole of that 40 years. And that does give us quite a number of advantages, but also a number of responsibilities, which are perhaps slightly different from those of you who are conducting a one name study on your own. And just as an example of a collective one name study, our 40th anniversary weekend reunion finished yesterday. And we had a number of in-person events and also some online events. And this is something that is a, an artifact in our Braund Museum. It's a little medallion, came from eBay. It's about two centimetres in diameter. And I'd shown it as part of a talk about some of the artifacts that we have. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the museum later on. And immediately, because I said, this is somebody, I don't know who this was. I don't know who E.J. Braund was. I can't find anything out about the Bridgewater KO, presumably knockout cup. I don't even know if this is 1949 or 1849. And to be fair, I hadn't researched this for a few years. So immediately, at least five people in the Zoom room we're Googling away, trying to find out information about E.J. Braun. And we have actually, thanks to Peter, who's in the room tonight, actually, um, and to others, but primarily to Peter, we've uncovered quite an interesting sounding story about E.J. Braun. But it was almost like waving a magic wand and watching a piece of collaborative research unfold online as somebody was saying, oh, look, I found this newspaper report. And somebody else was saying, I found out what the KO Cup is and so on, and it is 1949, incidentally. So how many brawns are there? Well, it depends where you look, really. Using the data on the britishsurnames.co.uk website, that's where those figures that say 10 years ago and now came from, because some of you will have heard us give a, a fairly, in some ways, similar talk to this 10 years ago. 
And 10 years ago, I looked at the rankings and I did it again. Now, I can't believe that the population of brawns in the UK has nearly doubled in 10 years. I think they must be getting their figures some other way. Or I, I don't understand that at all. We're not suddenly terribly prolific or anything. Um, but it's, I suppose, a medium sized study in one name study terms. Neither do I believe that the number in the USA has remained unchanged for 10 years but uh, clearly Australia have, have moved on. So just to give you some idea how many people we are dealing with when we're researching the bronze. Ah, this is Chris's bit. Over to you for how the Bronze Society was founded. Right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, this gentleman, Cyril John Bronze, in 1981 on doctor's advice, retired back to North Devon. He was meeting people with the same surname that he didn't know. One of the chaps he met was my father, Leonard Braun. And his question to him was, do you know anything about the family history? Well, in those days, we thought we came from a fishing village um, about seven miles from Biddyford, where we live. And that was it. And uh, my father said, well, yes, I know a little bit about it. And he said, well, shall we try and form a society and unite the family? So that's how we started. Now, what do you do to start a society like ours? Well, we put in three adverts in the local press, the local Biddyford Gazette, the North Devon Journal, and the Western Morning News, which covers the West of England and the North of England and parts of Cornwall. And the ad read something like, anyone, in, anyone with a surname Browns or descendants from the Browns would like to come to the New Mid Hotel on a Sunday afternoon, they'd be most welcome. Now, I say Cyril, um, yeah, he was an organiser. I was living on the Isle of Wight at the time. I came home to Biddyford. I picked my father up the Sunday morning, took him down to the New Inn Hotel to meet Cyril. And uh, he said, oh, he said, we're a bit short of chairs. We don't, didn't know how many was coming, but we got to make sure we got enough chairs for them to sit on. So we, we went down to the local convent of all places and loaded up a trailer load of chairs, took them back to the hotel. At about half past one, quarter to two, I went back to the New Inn Hotel after I had some lunch. And Sir, um, Cyril came up to me, slapped a, um, a name tag on my chest. He said, there you are. You're the steward. Get on the door. And that's what turned up. There's over 200 people there that turned up for our inaugural meeting. Yes. Right, well, thank you very much, Chris. You can take a back seat now. That's your moment of fame. <laughs> and I would say that uh, I, I was a founder member. I wasn't at the inaugural meeting. I was extremely heavily pregnant at the time and also living on the Isle of Wight. So I, I didn't actually go, but I was a founder member. And initially, the society was more of a social group than a family history society. The family history that was done probably for the best part of 10 years was very much oral history and using items in people's homes and, and memorabilia and so on. Not so much delving around in archives. There was a bit of that, but, but not really any concerted effort at that. And then it began to evolve into a more traditional family history society, certainly by the early 1990s. And so what do we do? Well, like everybody else, particularly now, we collect data, very much focusing on original records when we can. We don't like relying on transcriptions unless there's really no other way of accessing that particular information a lot of visiting archives, particularly in the early days. Now, we're very fortunate that Braund is a surname that's incredibly heavily localised, and I'll explain that in a minute, which means that 
a huge percentage of the records we need are located in two in two counties only. So it means that we can get a lot of information without traveling the whole country. That's as far as the UK is concerned. Obviously, we then need information from other countries and like most British origin surnames, that predominantly means the USA, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. We do also have a little contingent in South Africa. There's also been some excursions to Brazil, uh, the Indian subcontinent and uh, Barbados. So we've got around a little bit, but those four main English speaking countries, there's a significant number of brawns and therefore we need data. But as a society, we've been extremely fortunate because we are not a one person, uh, one person research project. We have people in those countries who are able to contribute to that research. And we've been particularly lucky. Uh, we had a lot of input for Australia and New Zealand, and we had, we had a bit from Canada and the US, although, and that is now on, on the increase. So we have been very fortunate as far as that's concerned that Yes, we are relying on online access to things, but there's also people out there on the ground to help us. Some of the data that we collect, we have a, a very extensive photograph collection. And again, this is helped by the fact that it's a collaborative effort. So people have sent us copies of photographs over those four decades. Initially, they were those. Well, in fact, some we had those who have that shiny photo, photocopier paper that smelt awful. Um, some were actually like that and you couldn't really see them then and you certainly can't see them now. But of course, now we're able to have scanned digital copies of people's photographs and their quality is extremely good. We also have the museum and that's where that little medallion came from. And this has two forms. We actually have a collection of artifacts or poor old Chris has it in his in his house. Um, we've just had this on display. We actually could no longer fit everything we've got in the local church hall. And a lot of these are eBay finds and we like to try and preserve them. Sometimes if we spot something, we try and persuade a direct descendant to, to get it back for their family if they can. But in the absence of that, we acquire it and with, with the aim that we will preserve that. And maybe one day there will be a direct descendant who will treasure that particular item and the a whole array of memorabilia associated with the Braun family. Some of it is given to us. The Bible at the top there was found in a house clearance in the USA and because we were Guild members and therefore our interest in the family was quite heavily publicised and easy to find. I suppose 15 years ago now we received an email saying we have found this it's nothing to do with us we're just doing a house clearance would you like it and that particular bible which as you can see is in pretty poor condition has best part of 120 years worth of family births marriages and deaths in it and we paid the postage and they sent it to us so that's the, the physical Braun Museum, but we also have a virtual Braun Museum and we're just beginning to put some of those things on our new website. And these are things that we don't own. So the sampler that you see is in private hands, but we know it's there. We've been given a photograph of it so we can include it virtually, even though we, we can't actually see it and touch it. And we're continually adding to this to say often as a result of eBay, we've got a saved search, anything with Braun in it comes up and, and, and we see it, but also because people know that we're interested in this um, and the fact that we get our name out there as much as possible helps in that regard. And then, of course, we do analysis. It's always with the data been about putting people into family trees. Uh, we've never really been big on great long spreadsheets of this that and the other yes that sometimes has to be part of it but it's always about each record needs to be incorporated into a family tree and added to the information we have about the individual person and i'm not ashamed to say that that is on index cards and the reason it's on index cards is because this study is 40 years old when that was pretty much the only thing you could do and if anyone wants to transfer the information from 7,000 index cards into a digital format, please volunteer now. 
Uh, it also involves reading my handwriting. So that's, you know, the, the other caveat. So yes, it's on index cards. And each index card contains all the information we know about that person, together with the source of that information. So every fact has a source attached to it. We also have some projects going on. We've got some ongoing ones. We've got some which are, uh, to all intents and purposes, completed. For example, we did a collective book about those who had left Britain for countries elsewhere, and that was a series of biographies of those emigrant brawns compiled by different people. So I think there are probably about 20 or 30 different authors to the biographies in, in that particular book. We have a book which is devoted to those who lost their lives in various conflicts from the Napoleonic Wars uh, right up until the, well, almost the present day. So that was another project that was done by one person but with collaboration from other people feeding in more additional detail. <coughs> and we just had an offer this weekend from a member in the United States who has volunteered to look at all the brawns in the 1950 US census as each state becomes available to, to search. Unfortunately, the states that have currently become available uh, are not particularly heavily Brawned areas we're waiting for Pennsylvania and Wisconsin in particular, and to a lesser extent Ohio, uh, perhaps Maine, I don't know. Uh, and his aim is to record them, to take their line back to England, because it will go back to England, and also probably to take it forward in the hope of trying to interest some more people in the family history. So what variants are we dealing with? Well, here are some of the, the main ones. Uh, mostly we do tend to begin with BR. There's usually an N in it somewhere, and that's about as good as you get. And it's not possible to put one single thing in and get all those to come up. Sometimes it's broad as well, B-R-O-A-D. And annoyingly, sometimes it's brown. And that's usually because it's been mistranscribed. And that does become a bit of a nightmare. So those are the main variations of brawn that we are that we are dealing with. Allegedly, it means a firebrand. Um, I'll leave the members of the brawn family to decide whether that applies or not. And as I say, it is extremely localised geographically. So as you can see there, if you're not familiar with the British Isles, that bottom left hand corner is Devon and Cornwall and that's where the brawns come from and it's actually much more localized than that if you break that down to registration districts in fact in 1881 um, a quarter of all brawns are in just two registration districts so we're very heavily um, northwest cornwall uh, northwest devon sorry and in just into cornwall we have on paper 24 different brawn family trees that we can't conclusively tie together. Bizarrely, the numbers go up to 25. That's because there currently isn't a branch 10. There used to be a branch 10, and then it, we managed to link it to, in fact, branch six. So although there's 24 branches, there is a branch 25, which sounds a bit incongruous. And again, you can see very clearly that it's that northwest corner of Devon with just anything that's strayed across the River Tamar into Cornwall is right on the border there. In many cases, we think we know how those branches link together, but we just feel we're lacking that final little bit of evidence. We're hampered slightly because the Devon probate material, uh, that apart from the PCC wills, or all the wills that were proved in a Devon probate court, were held in Exeter during the Second World War, and were destroyed. So we're missing quite a key data set that might have helped in some instances. For example, I'm on, I'm seriously tempted to link branch 15 and branch 18. And if you can see the, the small little numbers, branch 15 is the one that's right at the top of the map at the north, as we geographers say. Um, that's a little village called Fremington. And in the south of the map, branch 18, about as far away as you can get, uh, that's Plymouth. We have a William Braund baptised in 1761 in Fremington, who, to 
for all intents and purposes then disappears. We have a William Braun who turns up getting married in Plymouth and we know from his date of burial, age at burial, he was born about 1761. Clearly, you know, they're called William, that's not enough. There is other evidence as well, including the use of some quite unusual Christian names in, in both families and the fact that both families are stuffed full of people who were carpenters. Add to that that the DNA is just one step genetic distance different, and I'm pretty sure those two link together and how they link together. In fact, um, all those branches we do believe have a common origin. We just don't know what it is. I do need to mention the Spanish Armada, uh, sadly. Oh. And I, yes, that's Chris laughing in derision. Um, I, I blame Charles, Charles Kingsley for this because I think it's the, the novel Westwood Ho that per, perhaps started this. Uh, the West, Westwood Ho novel does actually have um, a brand in it, a, fic a fictional brand in it. Many of us in different branches of the family, in and out of Devon, grew up with the story that we were all descended from Spanish sailors who were on a Spanish Armada ship that was wrecked off the coast of North Devon. They all swam ashore, they intermarried with, with local girls, and here we all are. Well, it's a lovely story, it's total garbage, uh, and sadly everyone believes it, and including the media, who every silly season come out with this story, uh, and we've had occasions when they've come down to interview us, and we've shown them our photograph albums, and we've said, look, and they say, what about the Spanish Armada? No, no, we say it's definitely not true, and this is why. And then they're still looking through the photograph album saying, well, but he looks a bit Spanish. And we're like, no, no. So it's like, do not mention the war, you know, do not mention the Spanish Armada. The reason why it's total garbage is that the Spanish Armada took place in 1588. There are bronze in Devon in the 1400s. Another reason why it's not true is that there's absolutely no evidence that any ship from the Spanish Armada was wrecked off the coast of North Devon despite the fact that there's some very Napoleonic looking cannons in a local park that they would have you believe were from the Spanish Armada as well. So it is not true, uh, but stories are perpetuated. It was in the Evening Standard in 1926, for example, and, and that's, I think, where, where all this started. I'd love it to be true, but it isn't. So if they don't come from the Spanish Armada, where do they come from? Well, as you've seen, uh, Braun with the spelling that is our main spelling, is definitely a Northwest Devon name. However, the earliest people using that as a name are actually in Lincolnshire in the 11th century. And that name then tends to convert into brand. B-R-A-W-N, which is another common variant, and incidentally, anyone in Devon or Cornwall with the surname B-R-A-W-N before 1900, I can trace their lines back until they become B-R-A-U-N-D. But the main concentration of B-R-A-W-Ns is sort of Northamptonshire type of area. And the bronze in Lincolnshire disappear about 1400, just as they're appearing in Devon. There's no one we can possibly pick up to do DNA or anything with a, a Lincolnshire connection. Is there a connection? Is the coincidence? Well, I'll just offer you this. Uh, these are the drovers routes. This is the Fost Way going from Lincoln to Exeter, and it crosses Watling Street, uh, not too far away from where that B R A W N concentration is. And there's actually a place called Braunston, not too far away. Both Lincoln and Exeter are, or Devon and Lincolnshire, are huge medieval sheep producing areas. I don't know. Is that how the Brawns got from Lincolnshire to Exeter? Is it just coincidence? We will probably never find out. We have done lots of DNA. We've done lots of Y DNA for people from the different Brawn branches. We can't test them all because some descend through female Brawns. And with um, three exceptions, one of which at least there was almost certainly going to be a you know, unexpected parent event. Um, they do match and we are of the opinion that all brawns share a genetic origin um, and we're, we're working on that. Some branches are closer to each other than others but they are all very close and if 
you can see the 18 and the 15 there, they're just that one genetic distance apart. So what do we do to tell everybody about this work that we're doing and, and how do we share our work? Well, we've got a website and more of that in just a minute. <clears throat> we've also got a Guild profile. We've had that for a very long time. And I would encourage others to, to go out and do likewise if you haven't already. I have to probably admit to being guilty of not having updated it for a long time, but it is it is there. We do use social media. At the moment, we predominantly use Facebook and Twitter. Um, we're not ruling out other forms of social media, but that's what we've found to be most effective at the moment. Certainly in pre-COVID days, we go to conferences, we organise conferences, and we attend fairs, both in person and now more often um, virtually. So that used to be our website. Now, websites for one name studies or family history in general vary tremendously. And part of that is understandable because different people have different aims for their website. And I think you should be quite clear what you are intending your website to do. And I'll show you what we were intending our website to do in just a minute. This didn't do it. And just over two years ago, three, nearly three years ago now, um, there was a certain amount of pressure on the Bronze Society Committee for the website to be updated. This was seen rightly to be very old fashioned looking, to have far too much text. Um, it was very good for those who were already interested, already researching. There was a lot of information on there that they could use, but it wasn't very attractive. It certainly wasn't a good way of attracting new people to give us information or, as far as we're concerned, pay us money. Um, so that it wasn't fulfilling its function. I was not a happy bunny, um, not because I loved this website, because I didn't, but because I knew that a lot of the content generation would fall to me and I quite frankly didn't have time to do it. However, the website was revitalised. We were very fortunate to have two young men in their 20s on our committee. We've always had an all age committee. And that's something that I think is very unusual in family history and local history terms. Currently, we have people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s on our committee. Uh, and I, I kind of like to claim that as a record. Uh, and that's always been the case, certainly since the 90s, that's been the case. Um, so we uh, took advice from these young men about what younger people would find attractive and they fed back and with gritted teeth, I will admit that, we took their advice because it's no good and there's obviously this big movement now to involve young people in, in family history and heritage and we need to do that because otherwise what happens to our work when we're no longer its custodians and it's all very well listen, you know, asking young people what they want. But if we do that, we then have to actually act on it. We can't just say, well, we've asked you now, tick the box and we'll carry on doing things in the way that we, we might have done. And I often use the analogy of a school history textbook. The history textbooks that I used in the 1970s to study the Tudors and Stuarts at the age of 16 look like this except without the picture. There is dense text, there is no illustrations. Two years ago, I was commissioned to write a textbook for school children aimed at the same age group about the same um, time scale, you know, still a Tudors and well, Stuarts, in fact, in my case. It's got colour, it's got bullet points, it's got blocks of, of pictures, it's got boxes, as soon as I put in more than about four lines of continuous text, the publishers were saying you can't do that. Totally different. And that's the way things are moving. The other thing to point out is there was a survey done, and because this isn't really this talk, those of you who heard my talk on, on young people that I did a few months or so ago, um, I, I said it then, and I haven't got the statistics with me because I wasn't intending to say it, but I will now have got this far. 43% of 17 year olds do not access information through the printed word. They do not read books or magazines or newspapers. 
everything, that's nearly half of all 17 year olds, are accessing information purely on a device. And we need to remember that. Uh, the other thing we were keen to do with the website was to make it much more accessible. And I'll come to that in just a minute. So the aims were, and actually the aims always were, um, to advertise the existence of the One Name Study in the society, to tell people about what we're doing and how we're doing it, and to attract new members, because obviously that's the succession planning, and also to provide a service to existing members who could find out information from that site. It was never our aim to share everything we know on that site. I know a lot of family historians and one neighbours do want to do that, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that whatsoever. At the moment, that's not what we want to do. We have a deliberate policy of not putting the family trees online and of not putting all the data online. And that's because at the moment, there are people who are willing to interact with people who are inquiring, and we want that. We want that two-way interaction. We don't want somebody to go to the website, take what they want from it, and we never hear from them again, or at all. So we, we want to put enough there to be useful to members, enough there as a carrot, I suppose, to invite that interaction in. But our particular aim is not to put every family tree or every list of births, marriages and deaths or, or whatever on the website. That may change, but at the moment, that's not what we want to do. And so now it looks like that. Um, a huge amount of effort went into um, making it look right on both a mobile and a device. So everything's all been checked for both for both devices. Um, clearly, there are some old, old devices where it doesn't work quite so well on, but we can only test it on what, what we've got. Um, someone then pointed out, oh, I, I, we had a soft launch in February, and um, I asked for constructive criticism, and I got it. Uh, and then, of course, I had to act on it, which wasn't so much fun, but, but a lot of it was, was definitely justified. And someone pointed out that it, not all the pictures were readable. If you are um, using an audio device to, to read a website, you know, you're reading it on, on audio, each picture has to have alternative text. And I discovered, because I was doing this on Wix, which was a, a platform I'd never used before. I'd done WordPress for years. But the young, the young gentleman said, no, we had to have Wix because it was better on a, on a mobile phone. Um, so I gritted my teeth and, and climbed that learning curve. And a, there's a button on Wix where you can press the button and it, it throws up all the accessibility issues with your site. Well, I got so many, I'd broken the button. And it, it just didn't work. It just kept stalling. And it wasn't until I'd manually fixed some of them to get the issues down to fewer than 99 that the scanner worked. So now that's done almost every time I update it. And, and so we, we haven't got those accessibility issues um, now. I haven't done it for about a week and I have updated. So there might be one or two creeping in, but that's done on a on a regular basis. But the received wisdom is that certainly on the home page, you don't want dense text. Um, you want to to invite people in, and and that's what we've we've gone for. Um, so it doesn't please everybody. It never will, but it's certainly working. We uh, increased our membership by ten percent in the within a fortnight of this website going live. So that says enough to me that that we're going and the, the right way about it. And it's www.brawnsociety.org if you want to see what we do. Um, so the idea was that it should be appealing, particularly to younger people, that it should be accessible. Um, and that's what we've gone for. So there's Chris publicising the study at, at a fair. And there's just a few of the little bits from our museum there. This is some years ago. Uh, and also some of our, our publications. I think that was the Southwest Area Genealogical Fair, probably. We were, I believe, and I think we still are, the only One Name Society to help um, stage a Guild conference. And we did that here in North Devon some considerable years ago now. And that at the time um, was the conference that had, had the highest number of attendees of a, a Guild conference ever. I gather that was claimed for the last conference. However, um, I think we had 215 in Biddeford, so I might dispute that. Uh, so that, there was us trying to fly the flag and do a bit for the Guild at the same time. But we do hold our, our own 
reunions and conferences as well. Uh, we do have a Facebook group, as I say, we're, we're concentrating on Facebook and Twitter. We've now got, I think, 574 members. This was um, a couple of weeks ago. And interestingly, if you delve into Facebook, Facebook is old fashioned now. Facebook used to be the way you attracted younger people. That's so not the case now. But if you look at the demographics of the people, um, this clearly is based on the age people tell Facebook they are. Those are people who are daft enough to tell Facebook how old they are. Um, but it, it is interesting that we have 564 members. You can also tell how many of those are active. And another Facebook group that I was involved in, um, they had barely 50% act, uh, active members. So that's high because I know I know there's people on there that, that are dead. We've had this Facebook group for, oh, I don't know, 15 years, 12, 15 years, ages. Um, so I know that I know that they're not going to be active. So that's a really high number of active Facebook user, users out of the total. And you know, two thirds are under 65, a third are under 45, which for Facebook is actually quite quite unusual. We do publish a journal, we publish a quarterly journal. This does still have, I think, quite an old fashioned feel. I can say that because I edit it. We do still publish it in paper format, although there's an option to receive it digitally. And that's the option that more and more people are taking, not least because particularly if people who are overseas, it's cheaper. And I don't think I've had a new overseas member going for a printed journal for probably five years. Um, uh, about a third of our members are, are um, overseas. And nearly all those new ones I mentioned are overseas. By overseas, I mean outside England. And we've published various books over the years. At the moment, these are only in paper format. When they are um, re, I don't know, second editions are required, um, there will be a digital format as well. But that's not going to happen just in the immediate future because I haven't got time to do it. But we have published probably a dozen books. Um, little booklets about various aspects of the family. And we've done some multimedia as well. We've done some um, DVD, what was produced as DVDs, but of course now can be converted to MP4s. We've won a few Guild Awards of Excellence on the way. There's just one of them. Um, so that's been another branch of publicity, I suppose. And we've done some other quirky little projects as well. So this was actually done for a for what was then the a Federation of Family History Societies competition and it was called Family Threads or Threads of Family History or something. It was a good long while ago. It's got to be at least 20 years ago. And the lady produced this to tell the story of the Braun family. And unfortunately, she became unwell and didn't finish it in time to enter it for the competition. But we now have that tapestry and it's actually how it's huge. It must be a good three foot across and four foot from top to bottom and it's housed in a local cafe because none of us have got room to room to keep it in our homes and we made a quilt that was for our 25th anniversary we got members across the globe to embroider or create a square in some other format and they were sent to america where they were assembled into a quilt and there's a, a key to that quilt that tells you the significance of all those different squares. So just another way of preserving the family history. Um, safeguarding, that, that kind of has two meanings really now, doesn't it? The safeguarding, I think, as far as the sort of seven pillars is concerned, is uh, it relates to succession planning. And we do try and try and do that. This was one of our uh, one of our reunions. Sadly, because of the other sort of safeguarding. There are not many pictures of young people on our website um, because we are limited to the number of young people that we're able to put up there for, for safeguarding reasons. Uh, and we don't feel that in general that that's a very good idea. There are a few, with one or two young people in there, but it's not something we want to do a lot, a lot of. So that does make us look a bit older than we, we in fact are. Um, but that was one of our reunions um, with a lot of members of the family outside the house that uh, the family were living in in the 15th century. 
we held a pageant we repopulated one of the ancestral villages um, with costumed characters representing former members of the family we did that twice the first time was in 2003 but we've done it again since then and and that was a good way of publicizing what we do but also involving whole families this is the second running of the pageant i would say so this would be 2007 uh the three young boys in the front there two of those are now on our committee so the, as the way of inspiring interest and bringing these young people forward um i think that's you know that that's worked in fact um the the young girl stood next to me who's my daughter she's also on the committee but she is now in her 30s um, so, so we brought them through the ranks, as it were, over the years. And as another way of attracting young people, we've had um, a young people's section for many, many years, um, over 20 years. We've had a, a young people's section, which we call Twiglets. It used to be pages in our printed journal. It then migrated to the website. It was on the old website, but in a very stagnant form. It has now been revitalized and it is being regularly added to. And you might say, well, who's going to look at that? And it is a bit of it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, isn't it? You know, if you don't put anything out there, nobody's going to look at it. So we, we're putting a lot of information out there, and gradually people are starting to, to click through look at it with their children grandchildren nieces nephews and so on um and and see what what they can do it's kind of aimed at anyone up to the age of 18 most of it at the moment is probably i suppose 8 to 13 year olds predominantly but there is slightly more meaty stuff um and slightly simpler stuff as well and that will be added to on, on a very regular basis now and this is this is Captain James Braun. Any resemblance to Chris is purely deliberate. Um, this is Chris's three times great grandfather in doll form. And Captain James Braun has spent the last, I think, 19 years traveling the world. He gets left with people on occasion. Um, there he is doing a bit of, um, you know, during lockdown, trying you know, kind of socially distancing and so on. Um, but he's been to America, Canada. Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Peru, all the way across Europe. Um, so he's very well travelled, and he has a he's got a sort of a bit of a blog going on that occasionally he, he reports back. Um, but I think actually I think the adults are just as keen on having custody of Captain James as the children are. Um, so there he is. So you know what happens next? What happens next for us? What might happen? For your one name research and I was ashamed when I looked at this because I looked at the version of this talk that we did 10 years ago and I was ashamed that more hadn't changed um, and that we hadn't moved further along as fast as I might have liked clearly the pandemic hasn't helped but that's not a, a, an excuse and I think we do need to reassess what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it whether that's as a society or as an individual, because you tend, the temptation and the easy route is just to carry on doing things in the way you've always done them. And that might be fine, that might be working, uh, but you need to make sure it's working and think about, is this working occasionally? Uh, we want to keep our membership up. That's, that's important that we need to look at what's going on with our membership figures, and I'll show you what's going on with our membership figures in a minute. Uh, we need to make sure we're maintaining a level of interest in the heritage of the family as well. That's what's happening to our membership figures. They're going down and they're going down steadily. I will say that when we put 2022 on there, there is a, just a teeny tiny little uptick. Part of it, of course, is that, that members die. And although we have a very broad age range, we do also have a lot of people who are very elderly so every year people die clearly they're not going to renew and every year there are a number who feel that it's no longer for them so each that 10 percent of new members that we got this year has only just replaced 
that we have had an unusually large number of deaths in the last year, but those that have, have not been able to renew this year. So we really do need to try and turn that steady downward slope um, upside down. So that's why we need to reassess and we need to think about why people don't feel they want to part with seven pounds a year. I, I need to point out this is what what they're parting with. Are they not aware that we exist? And that was certain truth in that. Is it the cost? And I think that's going to be an increasing factor. You know, seven pound may not sound very much, but in other societies, membership is a lot more. Um, and people are very, very aware of what they're spending at the moment. And I know some of the money saving tips that are coming out because of the financial squeeze at the moment. One of the first things they say is, look at all your subscriptions. Can you afford to do without them? So we're, we're fighting a bit of a battle on that front. Is it that actually their interest is fairly marginal and, you know, OK, they might descend from the bronze, but they might descend from umpteen other families as well. Um, and so why pick the bronze to focus on instead of one of their other surnames? Is it that they're only marginally interested in family history? Maybe that someone gave them a DNA kit for Christmas. Never a really good idea, I don't think. But anyway, that's another, another talk, I suppose. Um, so perhaps they've, they've lost interest. To us, we probably can't comprehend that anyone would lose interest in family history, but it does happen strangely. Is it the image that we're projecting? Are we giving out that image that this is, for example, an old person's hobby and that there is nothing in it for them? And I think there's a lot of truth in that one. And um, so, you know, what what are the what is the point the brawn society has a constitution because it's a because it's a society so we know what we are setting out to do but i think we need to revisit that and make sure that's still what we want to do and i think even as individuals where you haven't got a constitution you do need to think well why am i doing this what am i doing it for so our official ob objectives are to promote and encourage the study of the family history the biography and the genealogy of the Braun family, together with anything relevant as far as local history is concerned and you know, bringing in a few associated families with whom they interact on a regular basis. We're supposed to promote the preservation, security and accessibility of archive material in general. So we would be you know, helping friends of archives and that kind of thing. And this was the original aim and that this third one used to be the the most prominent really encouraging friendship and fellowship between members through meetings social activities and the issue of a regular newsletter and we do still do that and i think many of us who are members only have to look at our christmas card list those of us who are still and uh, I'm, I'm old fashioned enough to still send christmas cards to see quite what a high proportion of those people uh, are actually people that we've met through the the braun family and the braun society so what we do at the moment, we do charge a subscription which funds the administration and we have the option of a paper format journal, um, which a number of people still prefer. We pay for research largely from donations and self-funding. So you know, if we want to go and order a whole load of wills or something, we, we try and get that not out of the subscriptions but from donations and people are quite generous at adding to their subscription, rounding their seven pounds up to 10 pounds and things. We do arrange reunions both in person and virtually. And we do try and maintain contact with interested non-members predominantly online because they've got information as well. And perhaps with a bit of persuasion, some of those non-members might decide to become members. But if they are of that, group where the interest is marginal they do still have information so we do still have to cultivate those as well so the charging a subscription thing pros and cons i mean because we have to do it it covers the, the production cost the postage of the journal just now um the publicity administration and of course now you know we've got the website to maintain as well the donations fund the research and the purchase of the artifacts that I mentioned for that museum, for example. So constitutionally, we have to produce a regular newsletter, but it can be in any format. 
we do need we feel to continue that as a paper option if we were starting now as a society we would not have a paper journal With, without a shadow of a doubt we wouldn't have a paper journal but it's quite difficult to take that away when it's been offered 10 years ago a third of our members were not online that's a lot five years ago an eighth of our members are not online still a tenth of our members are not online and i've had this, this conversation in guild circles before having an email address doesn't mean you're online um you might sort of be online um, and we've had some examples recently where yes somebody's got an email address but they have got no clue how to open an attachment so just the fact that x number have got an email address doesn't really mean that they they're fully able to access what you're sending them by email or what you're providing on a website or what you're providing in the way of a virtual meeting that that tenth of members incidentally are ones without email addresses even or certainly not email addresses they want to tell us about we know what other people do we know people offer electronic journals only and i, I guess we're working towards that i don't think it's going to be imminent but i guess that will happen one day uh, a lot of people offer free membership or a one-off fee um, and have for most of you who are doing a one name study as an individual it's self-funded so what might we do in the future well we might have an electronic only journal um, we might have free membership the advantage of free membership i guess is that you don't feel quite so obliged to fill x pages of journal every quarter um, you know if you if you're electronic journal only the costs are much much lower so you can keep the subscriptions lower if you decide to have one uh, which would encourage people to join the problem is when you're in this half and half stage because the smaller your print run becomes the more per copy each paper journal costs you and the other issue is actually security because clearly there's nothing to stop someone paying a membership we send them a paper journal and they give it to auntie annie and, and uncle fred and cousin jimmy and so on but they can't all keep it and so if it's if it's digital it's more uh, difficult to maintain that security of that digital um, copy clearly that's not an issue if it's free because it doesn't matter if you know we're sharing with auntie annie and, and cousin fred and so on but that that's something to bear in mind i mean free membership would maintain contact with much greater numbers so we'd increase our knowledge base although we do try and do that anyway the journal size as i said would be less important but we still need to fund the research we still need to fund the website we still need to fund the administration of our reunions um so we you know we've just hired a we've just hired a hall we had an exhibition for a day we didn't charge anybody to come into that exhibition we had off ask people to pay for donations but that part was free because that's coming out of our our admin costs uh, so you need to think how you're going to how would that work well we'd have to charge people to come into the exhibition so you know it, it swings in roundabouts would we expect people to pay for paper journals at cost which is pretty much what we do anyway donations is that going to be enough to keep us going uh, we could build a small admin costs into our reunions at the moment we don't we charge people literally you know that they have a meal we charge them what it costs or by accident this time we charge them less than it costs but that's another story do we really want to go down the route of trying to do fundraising it's a possibility so what if when i come and talk to you about this in 40 years time not only will i be completely incomprehensible um you know what i'd like to say is that you know we've managed to sustain and increase our membership particularly amongst younger people um i'd like to say we've carried on doing what we do well and we certainly want to try and find more concrete evidence to link those 24 different brawn family trees together we will almost certainly be increasing our use of dna we do have quite a lot of um a lot of use of dna at the moment um but we could we could make better use of it 
we haven't uh, we haven't funded any autosomal DNA tests. We have funded a few and only a very few Y DNA tests. Um, we still want to publicise in whatever medium happens to be appropriate at the time, and it's probably a medium we can't even envisage at the moment, what's going on. It may well be that we do decide that we want to go down the route of giving everything we know in a public place because we're too ancient to to share it in any other way. Definitely we will be having more and more meetings face to face and online between those who are interested in, in the family and continuing to develop the website, which, um, you know, I could double that in size if now if I had time to, to add it all on. So there's a lot more that we want to get on there. Please bear in mind, if you look at it, you know, it's two months old. And during that two months, I've been organising a four day reunion as well in the time that I, in my busy life that I have to allocate to, to things brawn. The, the way the website happened, because I didn't have time to do it, was I got up at half past four in the morning. So most of that website was created between half past four and six o'clock in the morning, which may account for a few mistakes, although I am a, I am a morning person, I should say. So over to you, I think I can possibly work out how to stop sharing. Um, or Julie, can you turn me, turn my share off manually your end? I can Possibly. see, I can Possibly. see no controls. I can try and escape, but goodness knows what that will do. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, then you, can, the... you can, if you can put it back to the front screen, the front oh, of your slide. Stop showing screen. Has that stopped it? Uh, yes, and hopefully everyone can see something and not a blank screen. Um, Janet, I loved it. I thought that was a great, great talk, and I think it's a really good um example about how a study has evolved over time um and also is an illustration of what people can do and if you're if you're in a society um i think you have the um the friendships that you build over time and people sharing and i think that's a very different experience to being a one namer who is working on their own with perhaps just the the in the emails that you may get from people who come across yeah. your profile page um i just want to ask you just a couple of questions yeah do, I, do. I have them down. we've not had many questions as yet so i always have a few because i always have questions so if you were starting now if you were starting now and there was going to be no index cards yeah what would you what would you what would you do yes. differently? Um, if if we were going here, we you know we wouldn't start from there or whatever the expression is. Yeah. We would definitely do things in a different way. Um, we are trying to evolve and move with the times, but there are certain things that are we are still working with as a legacy. Definitely, we wouldn't have a paper journal. Uh, without doubt, we wouldn't have a paper journal. My personal view is that we wouldn't have a subscription. I suspect that's not a committee view. I suspect Chris, for example, would disagree with me. But my, my personal view would be that we wouldn't have a subscription. Having said that, if you then say to me, well, how would you fund it? I'm still not sure that I could think through that that pattern, but that would, I think we would be much less likely to have a subscription. I mean, bear in mind, 40 years ago, the subscription was two pounds and now it for an individual if it, with a, um, either a paper copy in the UK or a digital copy anywhere in the world the subscription is seven pounds I mean it, it, hasn't gone up, it actually hasn't gone up very much in the last 40 years compared compared to other things and I suspect we wouldn't have index cards although I, I do like to be able to see things on a piece of paper still um, so I suspect that that biographical information would be um, kept well, for a long time we didn't have family trees in a genealogical program either and it was only because my handwriting is so appalling and I got fed up with rewriting the same family trees I suppose about oh, 25 30 years 30, probably 30 years ago well we had family we used family tree maker I had family tree maker on floppy disks so that was the first one and, and we do have um, the family trees on floppy disks there are brawn family trees on ancestry they're not put there by us um they, they some are some are quite good um some are imaginative and some are total garbage 
But because 247 people have got this person as the son of this person on ancestry, we all know it must be right, don't we? Or not. Um, but so that, yes, there is an awful lot of misconceptions, not helped by the fact that, of course, Devon records are on Find My Past. So the mm. people who are predominantly ancestry only users are missing an awful lot of the records that might help them to actually make the right connections. So the the, the followers of the shaky green leaves are not doing well. <laughs> yeah, um, like you, I mean, whilst, you know, I always tell people, if you want to have a website, don't start with index cards. That said, I frequently also use index cards when I'm scoping out a presentation or I'm trying to get a family um a, a load of children in order or i'm trying to work out something what i have on somebody um it helps me think and then the cards migrate to my notebook more thinking and then it goes from the notebook to my computer more thinking um and, and eventually the cards and the paper goes in the recycling like like you you know i started a long time ago so i have a whole load of paper and there have been times when I've thought, maybe I should just dump the lot and start again. Um, but I can't quite do it. And, I, I, you know, I'm I'm building up to getting more and more online. Um, but I, ha I have I completely understand why you may not want to start doing was it 7000 index cards. I think you it's said you had. 7, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, I suspect if I had all the time in the world, or someone did come forward and, and say, well, why don't we find a, a digital way of, of conducting this information? I might go for it. Having said that, um, a one place study that I started oh, three or four years ago, yeah. um, I thought, oh, well, yes, you know, starting nice clean sheet, um, I, I'll, I'll do it all online, I'll do it all digitally. And I got in such a muddle with a ridiculously large spreadsheet. I've got index cards so, yeah. um, for, for, for the biographical information, you know, one card per person, because my brain works like that. Um, and, and I find that much, much easier. You know, but by the time I got to whatever it is, column ZX or something across the top, I, I'd given up with, with the spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah it's... um. I would rather have index cards over spreadsheets any day, but I think it's about the tool for the job and how your brain works in terms of how you process it and what you're expecting you're going to do with it once you've moved from what you've got to, to, the, to the future in terms of how your yeah. study evolves over time. Um, I mean, I have, I don't have any brawn ancestors at all, um, but I do have two brawn butcher marriages in my study. So I will work on those and I will send you those two family groups. Okay, thank you. In a GEDCOM file. <laughs> so you haven't That's got to right. transcribe it. GEDCOM files. Yeah, so you okay. haven't got to transcribe it onto index cards. Um, and sometimes you just need, I think that's the good thing with the Guild is that you can take you can look and see how many people you have in your study that has an overhang to someone else's study. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm just looking at the, the list of members that are with us now. So I, I, I have Woolgars, for example, in my own family history, and I know you do as well, Janet. We do, yes. And yes. my link to that is through my butchers. And I think that it's, yeah. you know, I, I'm gradually going through the members that have got a study where it mm -hmm. intersects with not just my own family but even my study so that you kind of have this little buddy system so I swap with them and they swap with me yeah. and then I link them as a source in addition to what the actual sources and I yeah. it's a way of uh, it's a way of just publicizing the other study and I think that's a good way mm -hmm. of doing it um, we've had one question come in and it says, do you find that after 40 years, there's not much left to do? Um, well, yes, yes and no. I mean, there's pretty much if someone says, I've got this brawned with, with not a lot of detail to go with it, we can say, oh, yes, that's unusual. Yes, they're branch 15, sort of almost out of my head. Um, obviously, there is access to new records coming online all the time. So 
you know, 1921 census here, the 1951 census in the US, um, which is bringing, bringing them down towards the present. Um, we have done pretty exhaustive research on what's going on in Devon. So to, to try and push any of those branches further back is now, I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm saying it's extremely unlikely because we're at the point where the parish registers don't exist anymore and so on. And because we can sort of think, well, we think this is this, this person is this person, but it's all the standard records have been tried to see if we can prove it, we can't or confirm it. And, and we can't. So, yeah, there will be. St there is still stuff to do, and there's, there's stuff to do. Not so much on that. There might be less on the data collection, but there's a lot more to do on the publicising, the preservation, and so on, and and the telling the stories. And I think telling mm -hmm. is hugely important. It's, you know, I know some some people just love the spreadsheets and love the data in in lots of tables and this that and the other, and probably don't even get as far as putting people in family trees, let alone telling the stories. For us, it's always been about those stories. Oh. Yeah, can I, I ask you a question? You can. How many, how many index cards did you have 25 years ago? Not many fewer than we've got now. So Not we many fewer. No. No, right. haven't added very well. I've lived here 16 years. I've not added very many new index cards in those 16 years. So okay, so. I was just wondering if, if 25 years ago you could have started digitizing things. No, right? no, sadly no. We were already too far down the line. You see, we we just started mm. too long. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I looked at uh, Fan Life Path's electoral rules three days ago, four days ago, and I've got 9,800 entries. <laughs> Goodness me. Yes, yes. Well, of and course, we, thought, don't have, yeah, we don't have a card per entry. We just have a card per person. Yeah, well, I realise that there's going, yeah. <laughs> going to be some duplication. Yeah. And but I, I thought, is it worth doing it? You know, do us, yeah. I mean, it would take me the next five years probably, but is it worth yeah. doing? I think you've got to prioritise your time, and I have to say that we don't do a great deal of bringing things up to date. Mm. Um, partly because of you know GDPR and all this kind of thing, but partly because uh, what we what we tend to do if someone new comes to us, then we'll follow up what we need to follow up to link that person to I don't know the 1939 register or or what. But we mm. don't do a lot of oh this person was born in 2005, let's add them on. Um, so so we tend not to and, and the family trees that are on family tree maker it's literally just used as a family tree drawing mechanism we don't um put source citation we don't use all the bells and whistles of family tree maker mm. Mm. Well, that'd that'd be good. if i can come in the advantage there is with the card index it is there when the computer goes down the electric <laughs> goes or the battery's flat You've finished, but the card yeah. index is there. Yeah, but and then you. Wait, 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 wait a minute, Chris. That way, the only way you could work on your index if you got a letter in the post. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. But as I say, you know, we've been going for 40 years. Yeah, no. A uh, fortnight ago, a young man came and knocked on the door and he said, would you be interested in these? And he gave me five books. He said, just uh, uh, open the cover. And it's the Braun Memorial Library. We knew nothing about it. Mm. Now, now that's someone we've got to research who this Braun was and why they set up a memorial library for it. Mm. It also means we now have to find room for five extremely musty, tatty, mouldy looking books because we can't get rid of them. <laughs> but yes, it, it's true. And and I mean, what Julie was saying about sort of crossover in, in families, because I see Marion in the audience there. Um, my my grandmother's maiden name was Woolgar. This hasn't really got anything to do with anything, but I thought it was an amusing story. And because we do a lot of Zoom with Devon Family History Society, and we have a lot of chat after our Zoom meetings, 
somebody decided that I looked exactly like Sister Hilda in Call the Midwife. Now, I don't see it myself, but that was, that was the argument. And the actress is called Fenella Woolgar. And so we were in a chat like we're chatting now. Uh, and uh, they said, are you related? And I said, well, I don't know. And within 10 minutes, um, because obviously Fenella Woolgar is an unusual name and it's, um, it is actually her real name. I said, yes, we're fourth cousins once removed. <laughs> so it was like, sort of like, how did you know that? And I said, literally, I've just, I mean, you know, it would need checking, but that's sort of quick and dirty tree. And, and, and there she was. And I, I got her far enough back to link into what I already knew about, about mine. So, yeah, collaboration's a great thing. Uh, we've had uh, just a couple of comments. So Wesley yeah. says, thank you, Janet. This has certainly inspired me to strive uh, for more, particularly in publicising our study. Um, and then, and then uh, Marion actually says here, Janet, I think you're wise to keep your study on index cards. It's taken me over 12 years to convert the Woolga one name study to family historian. I won't, I, I would, I would not do it again by the, by the arthritis in my hands meant I just had to simply, my hands couldn't handle the writing. No. And, and that's the thing, isn't it, is that mm -hmm. it just takes so long. And really, we all want to research. We want to build the family groups up. Yes. We want, to, we want yeah. to find out what they're doing. And actually, putting stuff into a database from pieces of paper that you had 30 years ago, it's kind of boring. It's not um, the most exciting. It's not the most, you know, you don't feel as if it's the most best use of your time, yeah. do you? And, and yeah. I think we all, we all, our level of interest is never always at top pitch. You know, we have periods in our life when when other things come to the surface more and, and you think, oh, yeah, and, and I mean, because I edit the journal, it's, oh, God, not a 36 pages to fill you know um and although to be fair the last there was a period of time when edit meant right but i've had a lot of contributions recently for which i'm extremely grateful um but certainly doing that website which you know i've been absolutely honest about how much i phoned about it <laughs> um it, it has revitalized my interest again you know and and we i wish i had more time and that's why I ended up getting up at Buzz Four because I was, I was keen to get it done, you know, and and, uh, and put something out there. So, uh, so yes, different thing, different. I think, and you, if you feel you're, you're getting a bit jaded with your research, I think a slightly new project often will will bring that interest back to the surface. Sure, indexing nine thousand people from the electoral rolls is it though, Paul? I'm afraid. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a bit. Yeah, it's to me, you see, that's kind of boring. I would kind of look at the ones that I'm stuck with and, and build it up, but well, you need yeah. to keep a, a good research log and it depends yeah. on how good your research log is. Um, what about the migration from Cornwall and Devon up to the um, northeast? Oh, that's mining. That's yeah, mining. that's exactly yeah. what I've, I've just written an article actually about um, mining mining and the link uh, between Devon and Cornwall and up into County Durham and I was amazed and the the amount of numbers they're predicting so between 1815 and 1914 they're estimating that there were 250,000 to 500,000 that moved wow. from Cornwall and Devon yeah. Yeah. To, to Durham um, mm -hmm. and, and some did go back but most settled you know we, we've we've got a, a group that we know of the the story in some detail and they were um working actually just over the the cornish border at the time from, from calstock and they were working on the um devon consuls mines sort of right in and around the tapestock area yeah and yeah. that was radically declining at the same time as strike in cranlington in northumberland yeah. And the mine owners in Cranlington actively sought these miners and took them up there as strike breakers. And so there was a whole load of Cornish and some of whom had Devon origins, miners taken up there as a, a mass, almost like a mass migration. One stayed, the other two ended up going to Pennsylvania. There were three brothers that went from the Braun family and the other two went. 
went to America ultimately, but uh, but none of them stayed in in um, the West Country, in that particular little bit of family. Yeah, see, it's it's interesting, isn't it, when you you know mm. being a Southerner moving to the North. Um, I you know I'm interested still with with the mining. Um, my husband has mining ancestors, so I'm kind of interested. Um, so for me, it was a case of, you know, I go to a cemetery, I have a wander around. Um, and if I spot any headstones for, for guild members, I always take a picture and, and send them on. Um, and then I was kind of thinking about the mining and I have the same in Sicily, you know, mining was a big deal. Um, and of course, people then left the mines in Sicily and went to the States in mind, because it doesn't really matter what you're mining for. Once you have that skill and you're used to it and you know how hard the work is and how long the hours are going to be, you kind of have this, you, you're able, you've at least got work that you can do and earn from, even if you have moved, even yeah. across the Atlantic. Um, just that's the, um, the connection with um, South Africa, South America as yeah. well, where they sought the, the mining expertise from the West Country, largely from the West Country miners. Yes, it's it's curious, isn't it, where you, I can see that being something that you, I don't know, an, an occupation project as you kind of follow. Yeah. And I yeah. wonder, and I just wonder, actually, if all the Guild members went through their occupations of people were doing in their studies, whether how many studies would intersect with each other. Oh, lots, wouldn't they? Yes, yes. But again, that's more about the synthesis, isn't it? That's more about the... That third I think, step. Yeah, I think that's what um, the next generation of family history um, researchers are, are interested in. They're interested in identity in a way that perhaps people of my generation weren't. And that may be, you know, you can interpret identity in all sorts of ways. And they're interested in the, the sort of the broader sweep and the stories rather than the mechanics of researching. Not that they don't want to do that, but it, 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 there's definitely a slight shift in emphasis. Mm -hmm. And I ought to yeah. just put in an advert for the youth conference on the 7th of May, all day, £1.50, organised by the SOG and the Federation of Family History Societies. And I think if you invest your £1.50, it's not being recorded because, well, there are the re it was partly safeguarding reasons, but there were good reasons why it's, the decision was made for it not to be recorded. Um, but for £1.50, it's 13 hours, you, can, you know, if you only drop in for an hour, it's a bargain. And you will hear 10 young people with quite a different take on family history between them from, f from five different countries as well. So um that that's definitely something to to keep a lookout for and maybe find some some future one name as in fact one of them i think already is a one name there um and some perhaps some future speakers for conferences as well because it will give us a a fresh perspective uh, on, on what's what we've been doing for a very long time yeah absolutely um there hasn't been any other questions come through but i think the uh i think the the, the viewpoint is um people just want to know how people do do their study yeah. um so if you are somebody who wants to have the light shone on your one name study you can and you've got a some sort of presentation or you're able just to have a a discussion um we can do enough some more of these i've got a couple of people lined up um for the few months ahead but if you want to just email webinars at one-name.org, um, I will arrange some time with you and we can go through it. I think that's, it's a different dimension. Actually, it's kind of fun to see what other people do. Um, and yeah, I agree with you, definitely. And it's not necessarily that I think everybody should do what we do. Yeah. Um, but I think by looking at what other people do, you can decide what would also work for you but also, I mean, I don't care if people think, my goodness, fancy them doing it like that. That's the last thing I want to do, because actually you've learned from that and you've made a decision that that, that wouldn't work for you because you're not interested or it isn't appropriate or, or whatever. Uh, so I think you, you can actually learn as much from what 
you don't want to copy from other people as, as what you do want to copy from them. Yeah, can, I, can, I, can I ask, when, when did you actually join the Guild? Well, it wasn't uh, 19, 1983. Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, Chris's father, Chris's father joined the Guild in 1983. Yeah. Um, for some very strange reason, I actually remember Chris's membership number. I can't tell you why, um, but I just was able to double check the email address before I sent off the... 594, um, yeah. Yeah, and I've no idea why, but I just happened to remember it. Um, Don't ask so, me what mine is, but his is 594. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure yours is the 1-2 number, but that yeah, doesn't yeah, really matter. Yeah, I, I cheated with mine, I, yeah. because I started a one-name study and then someone else sort of took it over, and I became a lapsed member. And then I rejoined, and I said, I'll rejoin if I can have my old membership number back. So I'm a bit <laughs> of a cheat with my membership number. Although, effectively, I have been a member because I've done the majority of the, the research for the bronze despite the fact it's not my registered number one name study um yeah um uh, pat adamson uh, has just gone but she just left this message and it says thank you janet and the fisherman of course for your acquaintance <laughs> um really interesting and it has been really interesting so if anyone does want to have their spotlight shone on their study drop me an email to webinars with an s on the end at one hyphen name dot org and there is a, another webinar tomorrow. I know I have nothing else better to do than do Guild webinars. Um, and tomorrow we're having a really good talk, actually. It's a discussion between myself and three people, uh, two of whom are Guild members, and the Oxfordshire, exploring Oxfordshire surnames, people, places, and lives. I'm eagerly awaiting my copy to arrive. Um, and so it will be a really great session, I hope. Um, it's at 12 o'clock. UK time, so lunch time, um, because uh, one of the speakers is in Australia. So we've uh, jazzed up the timings, and it will be tomorrow at lunch time. So get your sandwich and a cup of tea, and come and sit with us, and listen as uh, the three speakers share about how their project, um, how it started, and how it's ended up, and what's next. Janet, Chris, thank you so much as always for a great talk. Um, I'm I'm inspired, um, and I think I think that's the one thing about guild members and their studies is that it can inspire people to to look at to review what they're doing and have a, a think about where they're going to go and just to see how other people do and to have that interaction. So even though there weren't many questions. But I think you explained it so well, and your enthusiastic the enthusiasm just came, just shone through. So, thank you very much, Janet. And nice I'm going to nice to see everyone. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to close off today's sessions. But if you're not a Guild member and you want to hear this again, you will be able to. The recording will be up in the next two or three days. Um, and you'll be able to find the link on the same page where you went to to register for today's session. And there will be a link to the recording. There'll be a front image and then you'll just click that and you'll be able to listen to the presentation at your leisure. So thank you so much. There's the presentation tomorrow and then there's one next month. And I think it is the 1950s census, I think for the US. Um, but that's from memory. So have a look at the website and see what's coming up next month. So thank you very much, Janet and Chris. It's been lovely to talk with you. Uh, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Bye bye for now. <laughs>